comes down to it at the end of the day. You're modifying the original, you know, old, like, you know, assembly for that game versus I'm going to create something completely from scratch, but I'm going to base it off of all this old licensed material. They're okay with the former, but not with the latter. This new god, backward compatible. Jim and Doc considered the legality of fan-made video games from the perspectives of both the copyright owners and the fan community. Plus, impressions of Assassin's Creed Syndicate, Seafall, and Laura Croft Go. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hey everybody, welcome to the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia, and as you may have guessed, Chris is out this week, so it's going to be Jim. Hey Jim. Hey Doc. And me, Doc. Hi everybody. This week we're going to talk about the legality of remakes and sequels versus ROM hacks. Yeah, fan remakes specifically. Fa- right, that's yeah. right. Um, and, and what that all means. Uh, but we've also got some, uh, some role play for role play and table talk about Seafall Legacy and all kinds of other things. So, uh, welcome. And to get it started, let's just jump right into a button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. What have you been playing recently, Doc? I've actually been playing the uh, newest Assassin's Creed. Well, hold on. Really? What? Yeah. You've been playing Assassin's Creed? That's so unlike you. I know. It's terrible, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> now, to be fair, I do usually wait until about a year after an Assassin's Creed is out. It, it literally just either sits on my shelf or uh, my dad's shelf might be a more accurate way to say it. Mm. I, I just steal his games, which seems in character for an Assassin. Um, but remember, this is the game that I was invited to go to the preview weekend for. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so I have actually played this game a little bit before, and before most people got to on retail. Hmm. And so that memory, that little uh, gem, that uh, pearl, if you will, has kind of uh, formed, and I was looking forward to it. I was really excited about uh, you know finally getting into it, and I decided that this was a good time. Uh, it is an Ubisoft game. It is a sort of repetitive game. But at the same time, there are a couple of things I really like about it. The first thing is you dive right in. Uh, all the sort of modern meta stuff with, um, I mean, I don't know how, how much you follow it, Jim, but basically Abstergo is the fake corporation that is mm. the modern corporation that is run by the Templar, who are the bad guys. Wait. Did you, what did you say the name was? Fake Stergo? No, uh, Abstergo. Okay. Yeah, it's the fake say, corporation. That'd be a little too on the nose. <laughs> That's a little too, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but then, uh, see, they have a licensing deal mm. with Ubisoft, and so they license out all this data from historical games from the, I know, it, it, it's completely alternate reality game meta. It's weird. Yeah. Um, and so when we're playing these things, we're playing real history that are real memories from real assassins. Ooh. Um, and that's kind of where they've gone with it. The Desmond story is, is lost and gone forever and, and, and long ago, uh, which was the first three games was the Desmond mm-hmm. story. And so now they've kind of open-ended it, and it has a little bit of a reputation now for being samey. You don't play an Assassin's Creed game with Without knowing what you're getting into. You're going to run around, you're going to uh, have little tiny missions, you're going to reclaim the city, whatever city it is. It's going to be a fairly accurate historical re- recreation, rec- recreation for your recreation. Uh, <laughs> and you have a really cool hoodie. And you do. You always have, uh, you know, these... The- you push people out of the way That's as you want. Right. That's right. Well, it's customizable now. <laughs> um, so you get, you know, part of it now is, is creating weapons, crafting mm. weapons, that sort of thing. Now, this one's a little steampunk. And it's, you're, you're high out, for example, is on a train. Hmm. Um, so if you ever watch like the, the old, old West, no, uh, it's Victorian. It's Victorian, Victorian era, okay. uh, London. All right. But um, so it's funny you say that because I was about to say if you've ever watched uh, like the Wild Wild West show, you remember that yes. old one? Um, and it was kind of steampunk. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, no, you know, it definitely, it definitely had yeah. steampunk elements. Um, in it's it. kind of like that hmm. in Victorian London, and that's what it reminds me of. And they did a, a remake movie a while back with had like mm-hmm. uh, Will. 
Did you ever? What was it? Will Smith? Yes. Was which it? was horrible. It was terrible. Did you ever? The giant spider at the end. Yeah. yeah. Oh God. And the and the guy who was in the wheelchair that kept uh, cleaning out the like ear the liquid earwax right. from his ear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was gross. So, did you ever play um, Arcanum? It's like an RPG. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. That was also a steampunk. Yeah. And that, okay, I think so that was this Victorian London as well. Correct. This doesn't push it that far. Okay. It's a bit like saying to the normal Londoners. It's normal London, but to the assassins, there's a there's a secret underbelly of um, tech that okay. comes from so it's like the hidden whole, technology it's, or something. Yeah, it's a hidden okay. tech thing, and that's why I said Wild Wild West is a really great comparison. The original series because he had all this secret spy tech that we didn't know about. Yeah, and and so that's kind of where it it's is. Like James Bond has all this secret spy tech that yeah. we don't normal people. Don't that's exactly use. what it is. But what I love about the plot of this one, uh, first of all, you're a brother and sister twins, and so um, you show up because you're. Basically Basically, like, we're going to take London back, mm. even though the assassins have said, don't do that. Um, and then they show up, and there's an assassin there. His name's Mr. Green. He's from India. And and he goes, oh, they finally sent me help. And then we're like, yes, yes, we're here to help. Lie. You know, uh, cross fingers. And basically, that's just it. That's the plot. You're there. You're going to take back London. Do it any way now, you want. Are you are you consistently switching between those two characters? You can control at it. Will yes, you okay. can. It's actually to make a terrible comparison. It's just like Grand Theft Auto. 5. I was about to yeah yeah in that regard. Um, but it's not like when you switch to them, they're in the middle of doing something that would be related to their. No, character, actually, like that's a good 5. point. That's a really good point because of the the meta of the genetic memories. You have both genetic memories, and they both did kind of the stuff. Mm. You get to sort of select in the in the running around town part. Um, who's doing which part of it. So, uh, do, do they play differently, though? They do. You have different tech trees for them. Um, and do people react to them differently is the other question. That's also true, yes. Okay. Um, and so what you can do, you can get to a thing like, ah, it's a locked chest. Wait a minute, I'm going to switch to Evie mm-hmm. from Jacob, and the, they're the Fry twins. Right. Um, and well, then I'm going to unlock the chest with her. But, but the reason I ask that is because um, typically, you know, assassins – Assassins or spies or those sort of like um, anyone that's involved in espionage throughout history, um, you know, men and women would approach it from a different angle. Well, that's like a, true. Very common for for a woman spy to sort of use her femininity right. to get into certain areas that you know a, a guy may not be able to have access mm-hmm. to. To use one example, so can you yeah. do things like that? Well, mm-hmm. for by default, she's the stealthier one, and uh-huh. he's the ham-fisted one. Okay, um, but you can really. You can spend your points, basically your XP points, to your skill points, to even that out, hmm. or to really push it in, in, and go with it. And so I pushed it and went with it. So she's totally stealthy. When she jumps, like no sound. But when he jumps, it's like thud. Who's that over there? Ugh! You know. And and he pulls out his gun and he shoots you. That's that's where I went with his character. And her character, she's like a silent cat woman who just comes in and just everyone's dead and no one heard a sound. Um, so that's the way I went with it, but you don't have to. And that's actually okay. – the role-playing elements of that are really cool to me. So – and they're both wearing the traditional Assassin's Creed gear, like robes and They can be. They stuff. don't have to be. There's no. actually dozens of different robes you can choose from, all colors, okay. um, that sort of thing. So he kind of runs around in Ezio's old gear because there's, like, stat bonuses that you get depending on what you choose. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's also a really cool one. Um, it's like a top hat, and it's purple. I made it purple. Um, and I like to walk around town in his fancy duds. Because uh, I, I, I'm amused by this, um, so. But do, do the clothing that you wear does that affect the mission? Like, for example, yes. Yes. okay, so you could be. Well, it affects your stats and your and your mission. But like, if you're wearing, say, stealthy or stealthier clothing to blend in, correct. Versus, say, you're going to go to, you have to sneak into or assassinate someone and say, like, a fancy party or right. something. You would want to dress up in fancy gear instead of trying to hide and not be seen. You're you're you might. Try to hide in plain sight. To, to use a comparison guess. to The Witcher Three, which okay. has that exact scenario you just said. Yes, it does. It's not at that level, mm. um, but what it is, you could say, I'm going to choose an outfit that allows uh, gives me a bonus to blending in because I'm planning on approaching this mission with a blending in style. Okay, uh, but you also have to be careful because you know. Uh, Ubi's writing abilities are what they are, and sometimes right. they'll they'll give you a hook, which is you're going to go into this party and it's going to be silent and it's a silent kill, and then within seconds the dude's running out the back door. You've got to go hijack a horse, chase him down, and shoot him in the streets of London, hmm. and that's uh, it becomes this basically uh, a carriage chase, and that's half the fun is the unexpected. How are you going to react to it? Now, I feel like I, I need to ask because this takes place 
in a Victorian London inspired setting. Yes. So do they throw in say like a Jack the Ripper reference? You know or that's the expansion. Sherlock Holmes. That's the expansion. Actually, I think mm-hmm. that the people who are there are are. Uh, it's always been an Assassin's Creed tradition to have famous people mm-hmm. interact with them. So this time you've got Charles Darwin, um, you've got mm-hmm. Alexander Graham Bell, you've got in the expansion uh, Jack the Ripper, okay. and quite a few other um, famous people of that era. That it's really quite quite good, quite fun. Glad you're enjoying it. I am enjoying it. Um, if if people weren't really into the like the rogue. Or um, the one that was set in Paris, that kind of a thing. So you skipped a few entries. This is the one to get back in on. It really is. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. Shall we table talk, Jim? Sure. I've been playing some uh, some tabletop gaming as well. Have you now? Uh, I have been. So I'm interested to hear what you've been playing. Because I know you usually play some pretty uh, off-kilter games. Off-kilter games. That's a good way to put this. <laughs> okay, so uh, back in the day, I may or may not have been part of the team that um, playtested Seafall Legacy. And I may or may not actually have my name in the credits uh, really? on the... On the Rule now, book itself on the inside page. Now, I am picturing um, you're in some sort of a submarine. This is like a Sequest inspired uh, tabletop game. Is this, am I anywhere close? No. No. Um, okay. This, the real name of this game should be Merchants and Marauders Legacy mm. in the same spirit of Risk Legacy. Oh, okay. okay? So okay. Risk Legacy was all about basic risk and then you do certain things which trigger opening of envelopes which bring out new cards and new stickers that you stick on the board and that you stick on uh, in the rule book and it changes the rules. And it becomes by the time you're done with the 15 or so game um, campaign, you're playing the very complex risk. Yeah. A lot, along the lines of, say, Risk 2210. Okay. Um, or some of the you know risk god storms, or some of the other risks that were coming out. Uh, the interesting thing about the risk is that uh, Rob Davio actually was not well hailed for that crossover game because it existed in the hobby space mm-hmm. by Hasbro, um, and as a result of that, they technically sold it. They kind of had to. He already had it. He's like, guys, it's ready. He worked on it sort of stealthily himself for three years, mm. um, but. He was, you know, he was really excited about this legacy as a game mechanic that wasn't being used. Mm. The idea of your board game becomes something different than my board game, and whenever you're done with it, you have a set board game uh, that is different from anyone else's, and you can keep playing it into perpetuity. Even when you're done with the campaign, you're just playing in your unique world. I don't think anybody really appreciates that that's what he was technically going for. In fact, his original, original idea was Clue Legacy, as in the old Clue game. Right. And that one never even got made. Uh, it never will now because Hasbro. Uh, but what's interesting is he went rogue for a little while, uh, worked on Seafall Legacy, and then was picked up uh, finally uh, by Plaid Hat and uh, also Z-Man. Hmm. And so, long story short, he had a chance to bring out Legacy, um, Seafall Legacy. And this one is a lot more complicated. Instead of having envelopes that you open, you have chests that open, their little boxes that open. Um, again, you change the rules. Again, you put things down. But what's cool about this one is you start out with basically an empty sea, and it's a hex grid. And when you go out and you explore the ocean, you are actually exploring for islands. And those islands will come out off of a sticker, and you will stick them down on the hex. And for the rest of the time you play, that's where that island is. Is mm. so you're going out to sea, you are finding islands, you are exploring. Oh, this is the Triforce hunt in Wind Waker. In a way, yeah. There's <laughs> there's definitely some some similarities there. You get far enough into it, um, and you discover the true nature of this world. Mm. Of course, the Pirate King is an element out there. There are um, some civilizations you have to go to battle with. You have to decide if you're going to become a pirate yourself if you, because it's a five player game yeah. are you going to attack and be aggressive with your other players are you going to go pure merchant uh, how so, are you going to play so I'm hearing this is this is sort of a a fake setting but is it kind of a Caribbean inspired yeah, like 1800s kind of setting 1900s. You, know what, you know what it reminds me of mm-hmm. and I don't think anybody's going to get this reference uh, but it reminds me of Pirates of the Spanish Main which was a little uh, collectible card game that was con- considered a constructible card game you actually mm-hmm. punch out the little styrene ships and put them together and then throw them out as a minis game it kind of reminds me of that 
You have two ships. They're out on the board. You get a bonus if they're together. You uh, deck out and, and stat out your ship. You buy upgrades. Do all that stuff. You go out to sea. You buy stuff. You interact with the natives. There's story elements, a lot like... Um, Oh, uh, above and below, for example, mm-hmm. where you break out the storybook from time to time. There's secret elements. I am really pulling my punches here because spoilers would be huge for this, and I don't want to give any. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think I have given any. Um, but what I can say is this game surprised me. We are into our ninth game. All but one of the boxes are open, and I am already um, poised with, to, to buy a second copy and play again. Mm-hmm. Well, so, so how long does one session take? To, to play the game. Well, that's a really so good an question. Idea. And you know what? That's been one of the bigger complaints by a lot of people. Um, whereas Risk Legacy actually took about an hour to an hour and a half to play each Risk game, this one is a little bit more like a Merchants and Marauders game. It's two to three to four hours per session. But it's still a lot shorter than Twilight Imperium. But if you, well, that's very true. <laughs> but if you know what you're playing, and you know what you're signing up for, mm. and you've got a group of uh, you know five people who are really into it, it's great. That said, I think Rob knows that people will drop out of a game and they will be added into a game. And so there are rules in the rule book for how to do that, how to add someone late into the game, um, how to sort of level them up as a new player in the third or fourth uh, or even fifth. There is a certain box that basically it says, we recommend that you not add new players after this box is opened. But I think that's fair. Because at that point, so many of the mechanics have, have done. Now, that said, um, you know, we have a sort of a wild card slot mm. that, that three different people have rotated in and out of, and it hasn't been that bad. Mm. Uh, but it's, cool. it's neat because my particular race, I went the direction I wanted to. They go out, they collect art, um, and I've won three or four of those nine so far. I'm in second place. So I'm enjoying it. Seafall Legacy. Definitely worth picking up if you liked the Legacy series. Um, very, very different from uh, some of the other Legacy games that come out. Not that different from Risk, but at the same time, better. Cool. I'll have yeah. to try it sometime. Super looking forward to Rob Davio's next game. I'm hoping I can playtest it. <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint. Is hint, that hint. Hint, hint. Yeah. yeah. This is Roleplay for Roleplay. The mechanics of tabletop role-playing games. I'd like to do a little bit of uh, role play for role play. This uh, goes into a little bit more of the um, almost the narrative or the character aspect of role play, specifically oh, pen, okay. pen and paper role play. I can't wait. Um, so I've been playing as as uh, I, I've talked a little bit about D and D Fifth Edition. Yeah. Uh, with sure. some some friends, we play try to play weekly. Um, some of them are not in the same city, and so, sometimes you play very weekly. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh, ah. Yes. Um, so we've been using uh, Roll Roll Twenty, which is a website that allows you to play um, sort of virtually. Yeah, with people I'm familiar with logging that. In. It's actually pretty cool. Um, it's it's the best thing that we have. There's a lot of bugs in it, but it's the best that we have. Sure. So it's, it's so you it's, have a lot of useful. distance players, basically. Um, we have one, and then sometimes one of our other players will distance, and most of us can actually get together. Cool. We have actually experimented with all of us distance, and even though um, two of the players live in the same house. <laughs> but we, no, but, we but we went to, they went to different rooms because we wanted to test it out and it actually worked pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, I do kind of like the inside the same room experience as much as we can. But anyway, so uh, in this particular game today, we tried something a little bit different because we have different role playing styles. Sure. And well, um, every group does, and every yes. player does. Well, one of my friends um, and I, we tend to get a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. Aggressive and self-serving would be the best way that I can put it. <laughs> than the other, than, than the other uh, uh, players, and so who one of whom was originally a paladin, and uh, was allowed to by the GM to sort of go a quote path of the gray, so that he could not be quite not not have such a stick up his butt mm-hmm. because the rest of because a couple of us were sort of going in a little bit of a darker direction it would sort of kind of ruin the game if you have one player that's trying to, to do no let's be a goody two shoes and then the other two being no let's just do this because it'll get us money and you constantly do that that's at true. a certain point you can't really have a campaign yeah well the opposite is true too if you've got a trader right um, so you need to at least be be okay with with following a certain direction. Yeah. Um, so we've been playing for, for a while now, a few months now, and uh, we're all up to level eight, which is, takes some time in yeah. D&D, so we've definitely been playing in for a while. In fifth ed, yeah. Yeah. So at this point, um, what I, 
I was called, uh, a couple, both of us actually, were called uh, murder hobos. What? Which is a term that I hadn't heard of before. I'm sorry, so what? He had to, had to explain it to me, but it actually kind of makes sense. Okay. So essentially, uh, uh, and I'll, let me read off this, uh, this definition here since it'll probably say it a little bit better than I can, but um, it, generally it's not a, not a positive term. Um, it's, no, it's, really. So, okay, so it arises from the fact that most adventuring characters are typically homeless vagrants. If you think about it when you're playing like oh, a TNP, you're basically a homeless <laughs> vagrant for, for starters. Uh, uh, but sure, I'll give you're you just, that. you're always on the road, you're traveling, you're not really, mm-hmm, you don't really mm-hmm. live anywhere, you don't have a job per se. Going from town to town. Right. Uh, but the murder hobo, their default solution to problems that they face as an adventurer is to basically, you know, kill things and then take the treasure. Yeah, you stab it till it dies. Yeah. Right. So um, a murder hobo is someone that is, uh, you, you've been tasked with breaking into a home and trying to say you're going to get some information on some sort of big official and you're going to use it to bribe them later and have all this like backstory <laughs> hypothetically. The murder hobo just walks into the house. Uh, kills the guy and says, okay, well, now he's no longer in charge, so I guess we won, right? I mean, that's the murder hobo solution. There's none of this blackmail. There's none of this, like, espionage or intrigue. Just, he's dead. Let's move on. You know, I think that's how I played Skyrim, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, now, to be honest, um, I've been playing with this same group for a while. Um, these are some college buddies that mm-hmm. I've known mm-hmm. for about the 15 years. The guild of murder hobos. Uh, at one point, we did actually play a game, and it wasn't a and d based game, but it was a, a pen and paper game, in which... Our characters were, were pretty much just murder hobos. We would just go around and just essentially we were all evil characters. Right. That's not what we are in this game. Oh, okay. But I will admit that uh, <laughs> we are definitely gray characters. Mm. Um, essentially, uh, to, to explain this a little bit to give so you some context. So you're just manslaughter hobos. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, basically, so we were, t- we were transformed into uh, living dolls by this witch. Oh, my. And we were tasked with um, scaring a family. So we all had different ways that we approached this situation. So um, <laughs> my, my friend, who is a, a fellow murder hobo, apparently, mm-hmm. um, his solution was immediately to go in and start carving, like, kill, kill, die, die on all of their walls. Oh, yeah. And then actually uh, sticking, sticking uh, f- immediately looks, looks for table knives to, so that he could have a weapon. Mm-hmm. Uh, immediately tries to stick, uh, stick nails uh, on, like, their toilet seats and beds to try Ooh. to get them stabbed. Just immediately jumps to that. That area, whereas our other friend, who is a paladin, is trying to go for much more subtle ways to scare them. Sure, yeah. Uh, I'm kind of more on the yeah, let's just go f- for the like writing things on. Uh, I, let me put it this way: I uh, I stole the peg leg of a young boy, um, and carved demonic symbols on it, and then stuck it into the bed of his sister, and then made it seem like he had or she had stolen his peg leg, but apparently the parents hate the boy, so they came over to punish the boy. So I, I just went back and forth having the parents punish the two kids. That was my that's the just way I scared them. Yeah, right. That's, that's just good um, parenting. Because whenever, you know, whenever the, the little girl steals the, yes. the peg leg, you know, yeah, that's what you do. Yes. You call in a priest and you, yeah. So um, essentially uh, this... Not so much that we tried to get it to this way, but the entire family ended up dying. Um, oh, oh, sort bad. of, sort of from bad roles, sort of from <laughs> from, from poor. Well, we were trying to scare them and missed. I mean, we, we had really scared bad, them to death. We had really bad um, stats, and plus, uh, we we even though we couldn't die for some reason, when someone tries to attack you, as even though you're a doll, you feel like you have to defend yourself. Sure. And they're very squishy because they were just random people. So, oops. But. Um, where I'm going with all of this is this, this concept <laughs> yes, of... please tell me. Yeah, this concept of this style of, of role play, where story be damned, you're like, I'm just going to get... I'm going to find the quickest solution so mm-hmm. that we can move on. Well, you know, I have two reactions yeah. to that. The first is, sometimes players, no matter what system they use, no matter what story they're telling, no matter mm-hmm. what it is, they're going to create a murder hobo character. Yeah. And they always play a murder hobo. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Even if the system doesn't lend itself to that, that's what they end up doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are systems which sort of encourage this behavior, wh- whether in, through design explicitly or accidentally, uh, you know, implicitly. Mm. And I would say D&D has a long and storied history of mechanically – being something that would encourage the murder hobo. Yeah. No, I agree. Now, that said, 
I think that there are ways to overcome the sheer pure mechanics. Last week, for example, we talked about fellowship as being a system which is designed to uh, encourage story. Like mm-hmm. literally the mechanics themselves bring in story elements mm-hmm. like the betrayal or the, uh, and, the ironic twist. And, and that kind there, of thing. even the name of the game has this, it's suggesting, okay, we're all in this together. Yes, that's correct. We're fellows. That is absolutely yeah. right. And from the beginning, it, you know, it's like, you guys are going to win. This is the story of how you win. Hmm. Um, D&D is, especially the earlier systems, um, it is not assumed that you're going to win. Oh, it's not assumed in our game either. Well, that largely depends on the GM. Um, we, we've had one of our but, characters, one of our players die with two different characters and had to re-roll both times. Oh, Wow. See, there you go. Um, and, and, and I think some players, especially older players, might argue that that's exactly the right way to play it. I personally don't find those kinds of games fun. I don't create murder hobos. I don't play as murder hobos. Now that I know this term, I, I think I'm going to use it a lot. It's a fun term, isn't it? It is. It's a fun yeah. term. Um, what I much prefer is you know, to, to be the, like the support character or um, you Supporting know, the... Supporting hobo. Yeah, there you go. Uh, somebody who, who creates the tech or is the uh, the alchemist or the pyro or the whatever. Um, and so I could see being the, the chaotic figure. Um, in fact, in Fellowship right now, I'm playing the chaotic figure. I'm playing the brownie figure who is uh, this little uh, sort of six-inch tall uh, little crazy man who wears a rat for a cloak. And he just he's just chaotic. But he ultimately, at the end of the day, he's doing it. For the good of the fellowship, right? You know what I right. mean. He's not out. He's not to just, running up, stab, stabbing pins into people's feet as they walk by, yeah. just to do so. And he certainly doesn't. Well, actually, he might do that because he's mischievous. But ah. uh, he certainly doesn't care about the money. It's not about the treasure. It's not about the loot. It's not about leveling up. It's not about any of that mm-hmm. stuff. Um, it's you know, in, in the, most of the games, that, especially the narrative heavy games that uh, that I play, it's about thinking of it in terms of story tropes. Mm -hmm. And I always come back to, if this was a movie or if this was a TV series, what kind of character would the, just the, the, the axe wielding barbarian be? Would he be the main character? Well, maybe if we're watching, uh, crawl, yeah. Or Conan, Conan yeah. right? Yeah. Um, even like Gru the Wanderer, yeah. you know that old comic mm-hmm. book. Um, you know he's kind of a murder hobo too, in a way. Um, oh, I would I would describe Conan very much as a murder hobo. Right. Um, now, even though, and, and the thing is, it, it the name itself suggests evil, but it's not actually an evil character. Well, not necessarily. If he's going around, well, it, a lot of it depends on the world that he's living in. Exactly. If it's a civilized world, then that could be bad. But if it's a chaotic world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's funny. I actually think of The Witcher here in this moment. Witcher 3, I think, did a great job of, of getting across the idea of the world, but it also got across the idea of cities and civilization. Mm-hmm. Once you go outside of the boundaries of whatever town you're in, all bets are off. Oh, yeah. The the person you come across in the on the roads, he might try to kill you, and if that's the case, you kill him. Um, especially in small towns where there's like, you know, there's sort of like backwater trash. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're like, oh, I got a witcher. Let's go get him. Ah, and then you're like, you really don't want to do that. You know, I really, you, you're my town, you know. <laughs> you're like, no, you really don't. Okay, fine. Here, I'll put my sword to Or your like head. backwater monsters that walk through the town. Well, and the monsters are different because you expect the monsters. To, you know, that's your job. Right. You're a monster killer. But I genuinely felt bad about killing people in Witcher 3 mm-hmm. because I didn't want to be... To use your word, a murder hobo. And that that goes so much against the way I like to play games. Honestly, I think that's why I kind of uh, washed out of the Fallout series as of late. Is because, again, it's a post-apocalyptic setting, but you were really a murder hobo there, too. Especially with there, there... There really isn't civilization per se. No. Anymore. So it's kind Little of all bets are of it, off. But I, for me, why I watched out of Fallout, not to get too off topic, but why, why I watched out of Fallout was just because the storytelling dropped so significantly. It really did. Um, there were no redeemable characters. And in 4, uh, the things that I ended up really caring about were the little settlements, yeah. uh, establishing the settlements. But then once those settlements were established, there was really no story mm. there. Mm. It was... Um, okay, let's keep the Abernathys from dying. Uh, that's not fun. Hmm. I can turn off the game and they won't die. <laughs> well, so I will say, um, you know, on the record that I will 
Now that I'm aware of this term, I will try to avoid being a murder hobo as much as I can. Well, good for you, Jim. Uh, it does. It does sort of fit my character to be somewhat greedy mm-hmm. and a little bit more self-serving, but at the same time. Um, at one point, this uh, this set of cultists were trying to give us some information, and um, I didn't trust them. So mm. instead of listening and waiting for the conversation to continue, um, I had this special figurine that I could use to form a bridge, yeah. like over a chasm or something. Mm-hmm. And so uh, um, I actually decided to use it to form a bridge through his throat, um, just in case. You, you killed him with a bridge. I killed him with a bridge, which would work. Um, and then Bridge of course, building, Jim. That's not what that means. And then ever since then, we then we were um, essentially kill on sight to all of these cultists for multiple sessions that yeah. almost wiped the entire party. So maybe I just need to be a little bit more careful and um, not just just jump to thinking that anyone that we talk to is potentially an enemy. Yeah, that probably is a good idea. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. I did want to talk a little bit, uh, this is kind of a Mobile Minute here, um, about a game that I just downloaded recently. It's called Laura Croft Go. Okay. And it's part of the Go series, which um, y'all may have heard of. Uh, yeah, Hitman Pokemon Go. Go. It's fantastic. It has no connection to Pokemon. Oh. Um, so this is not a augmented <laughs> reality game? No. <laughs> um, so Hit- Hitman Go came out about three years ago. It came out in, in 2014. And it's basically a reimagined version of Hitman as a puzzle game. Ooh, so you still play, um, you still play Agent. Oh, geez, what's it? Forty-seven, I think. Agent forty-seven. Sure, why not? And so you still you play him, um, but you're in this environment, and you have to, you know, move him through the space, <laughs> solve these puzzles in order to complete your assassination missions. It had a very nice aesthetic and all this. Um, so. Laura Croft Go was the spiritual sequel in this sort of Go series. And if you notice, these are both um, Eidos properties. Uh-huh. It was that were, Eidos true, was yeah. brought out by, bought by Square Enix. Yeah, uh, the was. game itself is being published by the Montreal division oh, of Square Enix. Okay. Um, and then, of course, a game came out recently, uh, that, a Deus Ex version of Go. So Deus Ex Go. Wow. And that's the newest one. That came out just last year. So um, I decided to download Laura Croft Go. All three games are currently on sale for mm-hmm. only a dollar, so I figured I'd try one. Okay. Um, and I thought, hmm, I, I, I like the Tomb Raider concept. It's been a while since I've liked the Laura Croft game, to be mm-hmm. honest with mm-hmm. you. But I wanted to give this one a chance. So I, I started playing it, and i got to be honest, even though gameplay-wise, it's of course, it's not an action, action adventure game like the Tomb Raider series is. It's a puzzle game. It's a puzzle game. Okay. But it captures that aesthetic of you are a Tomb Raider. You enter, you're exploring areas, you're, you know, climbing over walls, you're uh, trying to avoid traps, mm-hmm. you're mo- moving levers and creating spaces so that you can get through an environment. Um, so you really feel like a Tomb Raider. Like, of course, the whole game, the whole series itself was originally based on Indiana Jones and that concept right. of going through tombs and discovering treasure and, and looking out for old ancient traps. Well, specifically and, Raiders. Specifically that, that Raiders. opening sequence. Specifically the opening Raiders, sequence, yeah. exactly. Um, so... I, I got those vibes pretty much immediately when I started playing Laura Croft. Cool, you're making me want to play um, this. It's, it's very interesting in, in what it does. Now, I will say that it is somewhat trial and error, mm-hmm. um, but it is, a, it is a very simple game to play. So it's, it's all touch-based, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, all you do is you, you, there's a, a path, like a line that you can go. You can't kind of go off the path, but you know exactly where your path is. And so, like, for example, it sort of draws like a line of where you can go. So you don't know where you can't go. Oh, that's interesting. It's not like an open world area, essentially. It's not a runner, though. No, it feels like a board game. Really? It feels like a digital board game. Oh, my goodness. um, That, of course, when there's no enemies around, you can just kind of keep moving yourself forward as as much as you want. Um, Later on, there there are some, like, you know, more turn-based elements to it. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's there's an element of trial and error to it, which I think is one of the flaws. Um, For example, you could come into a room, you could see like a crack on a floor. Mm -hmm. Now, this was the first time I encountered it, so it was teaching me this gameplay element. Um, I didn't know what the crack... I I assumed the crack was going to be something bad, but I had no choice. I had to step over it because it was right in my way. Sure. So I stepped over it, and I walked to my right. Well, that turned out to be the bad call because the ground cracked a little bit more once I walked past it. Well, now I'm at a dead end, and I had to walk back over it again to get to the other side. So when I walked over it a second time... Correct. It, again, and you fell. And I fell through. Uh-huh. So it's teaching me, okay, if I see these things, I can only walk across them once. So I need to be careful and think ahead about what where I can go. Which was an interesting way to teach it, but it also adds this element of trial and error because I could totally see how down the line, if I don't know what I'm, which direction is the right way to go... Oh, right that's very bat, meta, yeah. Yes. 
but you always start right at the beginning of the level. So you, you're there's like um, I guess you could say there's a level and then there's like smaller stages within it. So mm-hmm. you would start at the beginning of that stage. So so far, it really hasn't been that frustrating. Okay. Um, the I would say the aesthetics are one of the one of the better features of this game. It's very beautiful to look at, and uh, the music and sound design is really good, too. So I would recommend it if you like puzzle games and you like the concept of being a Tomb Raider mm-hmm. more than you like the new Tomb Raider games, Right, if that makes sense. Yeah, I've never been a huge fan of the Tomb Raider <laughs> games, um, but I, I agree. The, the concept behind it is, is very cool. Mm. So, well, how, how is that different from, say, the... Um, Oh, I don't know. The Hitman one. I mean... See, I didn't play the Hitman one. Oh, really? But I do know that in the Hitman one, they got the, it's a similar gameplay in that it sim- like, kind of has that board gamey structure to mm-hmm. it with the movement. But you're also trying to assassinate people. You're I still, see. It's, you're still a Hitman. Just like in this one, your main goal is to you know, find treasure and work, and work through these you mm-hmm. know, tombs and crypts and what have you. I wonder if the jungles. Deus Ex one actually has options where you can go stealth or you can go run and gun. I don't know. I, I heard from what I was reading when I was choosing which one to try that the Deus Ex one injects more more story into it, mm. which is actually why I decided against playing it. Because yeah. I thought, it, it, to me, it felt like if this is a puzzle game, it's going to just distract from the, from the solving the actual puzzles. That makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah. Well, if it's a dollar, I'm, I'm game. Yeah. Check it out. This week's meaty topic of discussion. I've been playing recently uh, a new ROM hack, uh, Metroid Rogue Dawn. I've been kind of on a Metroid kick lately. Um, I played another uh, Metroid 2 remake, which I, I shared right. with you and Chris. That, that name, that title always gets to me because I'm like, well, which one? Yeah. Uh, but, but it is actually the A.M. R two right no A M two R I did it wrong uh, the A M two R which stands for another Metroid two remake and, and really it's because there had been so many people that had tried to do remakes or um, hacks or recreations of Metroid two his was just the only one that actually finished he's just being clever in the yes. title he's saying it's it's another Metroid two remake guys yes exactly okay I, I, and so knowing that helps me to wrap my mind around the fact that basically what I was playing as I was playing it was Metroid 2. Yes. It was just a remake of Metroid 2, which was originally on Game Boy. Yes. Like the original black and white Game Boy. Yes, it was. Wow. And it, and it was a very experimental game for the Game Boy that had a lot of problems mm-hmm. um, and because the Game Boy graphically couldn't really support Metroid. Yeah, I'm, I really can't wrap my mind around what it would have been like to play that game just because of the secrets mm-hmm. and the, the visual cues that are in the another Metroid 2 remake. You get lost very easily. But he also added um, Dr. M64, I believe. Mm-hmm. He added a lot of extra stuff to it to make it feel more like Super Metroid and Metroid Zero Mission. Right. Um, which I think was very successful. That and then the way that he did um, boss fights. Mm-hmm. If you'd like to talk, talk some about your experience there. I thought it was actually pretty brilliant the way he, he had all these varied boss fights that were not at all a part of the original. Oh, no, they were Metroid wonderful. Um, just, you know, gating from one area to another area, sometimes a thing will appear and it's like a guardian. Mm-hmm. And it's there and you gotta you got to fight the thing. And um, I don't, you know what it reminded me of? Mm. It actually reminded me a little bit of Mega Man in the way that was done. Mm. Um, Just sort of in spirit of there's a right and a wrong way or an easy and a hard way to beat this thing. And if you have certain upgrades, it's going to be easier. And it's kind of related to the area where those bosses are. You Mm. know what I'm saying? That's certainly true. Uh, So I'm actually finding the Metroids themselves, the, what are they called? The, the, the Mother Metro, not the Mother Metroids, the, the things that float around and try to kill you. They're, they're all Metroids, but they're in different stages of development. Right. So you've got, like, you know, the Beta Metroid and the, you know, okay, so, Alpha Metroids so and let's the Omega call them, Metroids. Call them the, the, the Omegas or yeah. whatever. I'm actually finding them really easy to beat because I ended up finding lots and lots and lots of rocket upgrades. Mm. And so I can just get into that sweet spot, crouch down um, and bend up, and it's like boom, 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 and they never get a hit on me. Um, as long as they don't get one hit on me, you know, and then I take some damage, but I uh, kind of have to run and regroup. Yeah, some of those Omega fights were a little frustrating. I loved the introduction to the first Omega that you see when mm-hmm. you go into that um, oh, lab yeah. and there's all those dead bodies thrown about and 
You're pretty freaked out. It is freaky, man. Yeah. Um, sound design is great. It oh the sound everything about that game is wonderful. And and again, it takes me back to uh, that whole idea. That I think we said that Nintendo should have just made him an offer. Oh yeah. I mean, it's it's worth it. It's they could have sold this game easily on. They could have sold this game quite simply. Um, and would have made plenty of money. You could have released so. this thing on the Switch with a little sure. bit of a graphical upgrade, maybe. Sure. I don't. You don't really need one, frankly, because it's because it's retro and it's nostalgia glasses and it's mm-hmm. all of that. Okay, so here's my war story. Um, in order to play this thing, you've got to play it on PC. You don't really have another option. Correct. Um, and so uh, I don't have an Xbox, and the Xbox controller on Wednesday, Windows is native, so mm. you can just plug that thing in. And it's plug and play, and it's fine. Uh, it's a driver that downloads, and, mm-hmm. and you go. But what I have is a whole bunch of um, PS3, PS4 controllers. Mm. So I grabbed my old PS3 controller, plugged it in, and then did a little research and downloaded to find out um, what I could do. And I found this really great driver um, that basically runs and, and converts so that it thinks it's a an Xbox controller and it's not. And... Um, it's supposed to work great, and so I was like, okay. Well, I also have PS4 controls. I have this. So I just clicked all the clicked all the buttons, you know, and I'm, and and, the, and I was like, oh, it can do Bluetooth too. Great, and I just cl- I installed oh, no. everything, right? Oh. And so I'm like, all right, ready to go. Push the button. My PS3 comes on in the other room. <laughs> well, crud. <laughs> what did I do? So I, un- I like I unplug it, um, and I just it was round and round and round. And round. Finally, I just uninstalled the whole thing, and I just installed the one driver, hmm. and it worked, and it's beautiful. I mean, it's so smooth. It's like native. It feels like it, it should be a part mm-hmm. of um, my PC. And and now I'm just, I don't think I'm ever going to just take it back. You know, it's just that, that controller is going to live in my office now because that's the controller that I use for playing games. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's wonderful. But that said, um, there are, there were some things I had to kind of learn about the another Metroid 2 remake as I was going through it, and there was a little bit of a learning curve. But oh, the definitely. amazing thing about it was Metroid teaches you how to play the game mm-hmm. as you play it. And so I have not had that kind of a gaming experience for literally a decade. Mm. A, I have not enjoyed a retro game um, that much. I have not enjoyed a, a, a retro like because we mm-hmm. talked about retro likes in a couple of episodes back, yes, we did. You know, ten or ten or twelve episodes back. Um, you know, like Shovel Knight, that kind of a thing. Now that I have played this, it just Shovel Knight doesn't doesn't compare. Mm-hmm. Some of the others just they just don't compare. This this is a classic game that feels right. It's got just the right amount of level progression. It's got just the amount of uh, of teaching. It. It scales well. Um, it's a brilliant game, a truly brilliant game. I'm glad you like it. I did. That's, that's why I, did. I picked it as one of my favorite games of last year. And so that dovetails perfectly into the real topic here. Yes. Which is, whenever we talk about these remakes, a, a, fan a, remakes, a fan, versus a, a really, it's like a, a, a fan project that takes some sort of a licensed character, a licensed game, basically, mm-hmm. and then makes their own version of it, whether it's a remake or a sequel or mm-hmm. a prequel. Mm-hmm. It's unlicensed. Right. And we're going to talk about that versus uh, a ROM hack. Okay. And for and those that now, don't know. Rogue, Rogue Dawn. Yes. Is that, is that, a, is that a remake? Or it's is a that ROM a, hack. It's a ROM hack. And that's, and, that's, and that's what I just recently started playing a few okay. days ago. So Rogue Dawn is a, a ROM hack of the original Metroid. Okay. And it changes uh, essentially. Essentially, ROM hacks. They do. They go in and they change um, the palettes, the tiles. Um, sometimes they even go in and actually alter the assembly code of the game mm-hmm. for, for some of them. Um, but they're essentially changing the game, the original game, the game's files, so that you can have a different experience. And ROM hacks can be anything from something simple like it was a game that was never translated into English, so we're going to hack the text. To have it show up as English text, that makes sense. You can play it. That's a simple ROM hack, or it can actually use level editors to make new levels because they've been made of various games like Mario, for example. Mm -hmm. And you can have a a very challenging Mario game with different levels for the original Super Mario Brothers. Or there's games that change all of the artwork and completely change the levels and completely change the power, the the way the the power ups work and the structure of the game itself. And that's what this is. Metroid Road Rogue Dawn is essentially a completely new Metroid game for the the NES. And Mm -hmm. it's 
but using the files of the original Metroid. That's the key difference between a, between a ROM hack and a, a, an unlicensed fan project. A remake, in other words. Yes, or, or a prequel or a sequel. That's right, why yeah, well, that's true. That's, cool. um, that's why I just say unlicensed. Yeah. Um, and and this, it's not that this is licensed. It's that in order to play Rogue Dawn, you have to have um, essentially a file of, of Metroid. Of licensed material. Yes. And then it will alter that licensed material in a variety of ways once you run it through a patcher program. That that will then convert that file. You can no longer you can no longer recover that file. It is now a different file. Right. And it becomes something else. So the the interesting difference here, and there's a whole website called um, just like romhacking.net, mm-hmm. and it's just this whole website of rom hacks. And some of, and some of them are very good. Some of them are very bad. Some of them are you, you, they hack a game to make it so incredibly difficult that you can't play it. Pretty much, mm-hmm. and some of them are um, very well made, like Rogue Dawn. And Rogue Dawn kind of takes a completely new story. Um, you are a character um, uh, named Don Aran, sort of Samus Aran. Okay, that makes to, sense. And it's sort of this this prequel idea to Metroid, where you're sent to the pl- to the planet Azebus before Samus shows up. Really, and you're trying to figure out what my connection is to Samus. You don't, I don't know yet, but the art is complete. The, the The layout of, of the planet is actually quite different. Um, there's a lot of use of slopes, which were not in the original game, mm-hmm. which are totally different. Um, their enemies have, used, have different patterns, and uh, you know the music is, is actually seems to have more sound channels than the original as well. Uh, plus, it actually has a map feature and a save feature. It does more things than the original Metroid could do, uh, mainly because the original Metroid was an earlier game, and this is sort of taking all the tricks that people learned how to do on the NES and applying them to this game through hacking all the files. So it's actually a pretty complicated project, but what I like about it and what I find interesting is that ROM hacks have kind of been this tradition for at least 15 years, a little more than 15 years. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, probably about 20 years. Um, and they pretty much go undisturbed for the most part. Now, there's a few exceptions where, where um, a company will step in and say, no, you can't release that, and mm-hmm. they'll, they'll send mm-hmm. a DMCA. But it's rare. Uh, one of the most well-known ROM hacks, um, Zelda Outlands, you may have heard of it, was released all the way back in 2001. Yeah, it believe. sounds familiar, yeah. And it's probably the most well-known ROM hack because it popularized uh, it a lot because it was a completely different version of Zelda. Totally different levels. Everything was different. It wasn't just a, we're going to make this game extra hard or we're going to translate text. No, it was hacking in order to make a new game. And, and ROMs have been around forever. Yes. I mean, I, I remember way back in the day... <laughs> Downloading some ROMs from some old Sega games because that was literally the only way you could play them. Yes. This was before GameCube or Wii or any mm-hmm. of those sort of re-releases before mm-hmm. before consoles were even online. Yes, and you know this was, there was a big deal about whether or not there was going to be a modem uh, that shipped natively with the Xbox. You remember that one? Yeah, <laughs> and it was like. Um, oh, we made a terrible mistake. We didn't ship it with a with a modem because that's where it's going. And now, you you can't even imagine playing games without them being online enabled. Right. So back in those days, the only way that we could play, say, the Shining Sword series or something like that, was to download the ROMs mm-hmm. um, or find an old system and somehow track down the old cartridges. Mm-hmm. And, and a big part about that too, and and why. To me, I mean, and, and I will, I will admit, I do play games. Um, I do emulate games, right? Sure, um, older games, and a big reason for that is one: you're not going to get the same experience if you download like the, a virtual console type of the game. True, yeah, because you're not playing on, on on the same system, or or a lot of times the emulation is frankly worse than what other people have oh, put yeah. together for emulators. Well, especially depending on whether or not they've done the clock speed right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> because um, a lot of those yes. old games were based on the clock speed of the system. Mm-hmm. And if you have any than... and if you have any lag, um, input lag can really ruin a lot of games oh, too. Oh, totally. Um, and then the other the other issue with that is when you go out and you just buy another game, like an older mm-hmm. copy of the game, the creators of that game are not getting any no, restitution get no money. at all. They get no money at all. And a lot of those a lot of times that the prices have been so jacked up now it's kind of hard to find them. Yeah, that's true too. Um, but but yeah, but getting back to this this sort of this difference of why I think, well, why there could be a difference here, or why it seems like companies don't care to shut down a site like ROM Hacking, which literally just has you know thousands of, of hacks of, of licensed material. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a big part of that is mm-hmm. they're creating something different and new from old old material. So they're not like whereas when you take something like a, a fan made remake mm-hmm. of a game like AM2R. They're taking a, a game that you know Nintendo made Metroid Two, 
they're saying, okay, we're going to make a version of it that's better. Don't bother ever getting the virtual console version of Metroid 2 because we made a better version of it, which is mm-hmm. what he did. I mean, that is what he did. Yeah, he really did. Because I played both, and I can tell you it's a better version. Oh, really? Um, much better uh, because of all the limitations on the Game Boy. So while that's great for us, it one, it takes away from Nintendo if they ever decide to make a re- make their own remake. Mm-hmm. Um, and two, it make it devalues that original version that they made. And the same thing could be said to a lesser extent, but of like sequels, because if they ever want to go back in and make a sequel of their own game, this has happened before. Um, there's been like unofficial sequels to say like Chrono Trigger, for example. It gets shut down regularly by Square Enix for the same reason, because this is their this is a big property for them. They feel like they have a um, imperative to keep it within themselves in case they ever want to make a sequel. And of course it could potentially damage the brand. There's all those sort of sort of ideas. Yeah. Um, well, I hadn't really thought about it until we were talking about it now. Yeah. But uh, let's just say the original creators of Metroid have this really great contract, right? And basically it says that into perpetuity, if anything with these assets or, or this licensed material is ever released, we get money. Oh, that's true. And yeah, so, I see that. you know, my, my grand and brilliant idea of, um, oh, yeah, why don't they just hire the guy? Why don't they just release this? Because as soon as they do, suddenly it's going to cost them millions of dollars because they've got to go pay, uh, you know, the original creators X amount of dollars for this. This is a hypothetical situation. But I could see that happening. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't know what those old contracts look like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then something like a lot of these hacks will, even though they're, and sometimes they do use the direct same characters, like Zelda Outlands. We're still Link and Ganon in those games. Well, of course. But they shifted around all of the assets to the game that you were playing had a different story, and the world was just switched around. Mm-hmm. But it was basically Legend of Zelda just kind of twisted. Sure. It wasn't really attempting to be a remake per se. I mean, it, it's kind of this weird, murky distinction where if you're using the old assets to... But, like, not just the old assets, but literally the old code, and you're just essentially modifying the old code mm-hmm. is what you're really doing when it, when it comes down to it at the end of the day. You're modifying the original, you know, old, like, you know, assembly for that game versus I'm going to create something completely from scratch, but I'm going to base it off of all this old licensed material. They're okay with the former, but not with the latter. You know what it reminds me of? It's a bit like um, going to the Louvre mm-hmm. and going to the gift shop. You know, because there's a gift shop just like you step out the doors and Mona Lisa. Oh, my goodness. Wow, Mona Lisa. And you step out the doors and there's a gift shop right there because they hit you when your emotional yeah. high is the highest. And you can buy Mona Lisa on a bookmark, mm. Mona Lisa, uh, the, the, the collectible book that mm-hmm. tells you all about the art. And, and that's a little more uh, academic. You can buy it on a mug. Um, you know, you can buy the Mona Lisa underwear. I'm making it up now. The, the point is. I'm sure they have that. I'm sure they do. Um, but at what point does repurposing the art into another function become degrading to the original? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I do. That's a good question. And, and that, I mean, that's that's one question right there. So we've talked in the past about this three artist model. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we're really saying is, if you, if you preserve the assets, those original artists they're not being they're not being devalued or affected. But what you're doing is you're changing the code yeah. so that that second artist of the developer is the one that's getting shoved aside. And then the third artist is the player. And so obviously mm-hmm. the player experience is going to be very different. That's a point. But, you know, is there is there a problem repurposing that material? Let me rephrase the question. In 20 years, would it be a problem? In 50 years, would it be a problem? Well, and, and also there's that question, just to kind of add another question, answer your question with a question. Mm-hmm. Um, but it adds that extra element of at what point does that game become something new? Yeah. At what point? Because if you just go in and you're, if you're just doing something where I'm just going to translate the language from Japanese to English characters, mm-hmm. is it really a new game? Well, probably not, really. But if you go in and you say, let's say you go in and you change up, you switch up the Mario levels so that they are structured differently. But yep. all the mechanics of the game are the same, but they're just different levels. Oh, is that question. still is that still the same game? Or Well, no. But it's but it's close. I mean, it's got all the same mechanics, yeah. just different levels. It's the same almost like the same game but different levels. I mean, what you know what I'm saying? The yeah, yeah. Are the same. No, I get and what then you're you get something like Rogue Dawn where it's completely different levels and music and art assets. Right. So, at that and story. So, at that point, but but it still has 
some of the same mechanics. You still turn into a ball. You still have missiles. You still have, you know, the the seeing the doors and that you have to shoot with missiles to go through, mm-hmm. or um, changing your changing your beams, changing your like suit, things like that. So there's still gameplay mechanics that are part of it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's like that 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 whole um, Odysseus is a ship problem. Like, at what point is he's replacing everything on the ship? At what point does it become a completely different ship? Mm-hmm. So, and I think that's that's what goes on with these ROM hacks is that some of them change a little bit, some of them change a lot. But they're all taking original material and just moving pieces around and trying to figure out a way to make something different. Yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, these these fan projects are taking something. They're they're literally just taking nothing but the idea. Literally, they're just taking the licensed material, mm-hmm. like the story, the characters, um, the world. They're taking that and they're making something new with it. Whether it's like a remake or you know a sequel or a prequel, it's still something new with it. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just... Yeah. Well, I, I'm reminded of the woman who tried to do the amateur restoration to a, a classic 17th century piece of art hmm. and ended up um, basically painting a clown face on it. <laughs> you know, this, wow. is, this, this made news um, a couple of years back. And that's, I think, the, the fear. I think the reality of it is that 99.9% of what's going to be created either will never get finished... Um, will be kind of mediocre, yeah. Or will be not hurting anyone because it's 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 self. What's it's recursive basically. It's, right. it's a it's a subculture of fans who are creating stuff for themselves. Right. That's really yeah. what it comes down to. They're not making money off of it. They're not mm-hmm. selling these things. And it's it's also their their fans. They're doing it out of love for the yeah. property. Yeah. And so what you got is. Two sort of extreme philosophies here. You can you can take the philosophy that that Lucas Arts has always had, which is basically do whatever you want, guys. The fans are the money, and you make as much you know fan art as you want, make as many fan films as you want. You do all this stuff, fan, 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 and most of it's going to be garbage. Stuff will rise to the top, mm. and it'll be good. Um, you know, I still remember downloading Troops, that very first. Star Wars fan film. Yes, that was so high quality because it was made by a little, a couple guys in a film, film studio. Mm-hmm. Basically, it mm-hmm. was long before YouTube. Yeah, you know, we had to wait like three days for that thing to download off of our fourteen four modem in order to be able to watch it. Um, that's love right there. You know, that that's mm-hmm. dedication to to fan nerd Um And then the other end of the spectrum is you said our name, you owe us money, mm-hmm. and I just I don't know where. I fall on this. I have to bring up Skyrim because Skyrim shipped the PC version shipped with a sort of an open mentality for modding. Um, it, the creator, all the assets, all of that stuff was there. Mm-hmm. So, but as I think a super important uh, sort of ingredient to that that you mentioned right out of the gate, you have to buy the game in yeah. order to use it. And you have a license working copy. with the assets of the game. Correct. Yeah. And so I think that that's, that's going to be one of the keys to understanding why the reactions are what they are hmm. in this. Did you buy our game? A, you know, if the answer is yes, then the next question is, great. Are you just using the assets from our game? Yeah. Okay, yeah, you are. Okay. And, and are you just rearranging those so that you can have a fun fan experience yeah, okay. Are you trying to sell it? That's of no. course, and that's another no, big part. Obviously. And and the other thing too is it's signs like um like ROM hacking and, and others that are similar to it, including the people that put these together. Mm-hmm. They never give you the ROM file either. They give you a a, a patch file. So you that, have to have that, the ROM file. Right. You can have right. you, and there's plenty of ways that you can get the ROM file. I mean I have multiple copies of Metroid, by the way. I have Old physical copy somewhere, like mm-hmm. like locked away. I probably have two of them, and then I have bought. I've actually bought it multiple times for different systems. I bought mm-hmm. I bought um, other versions of it for like Game Boy Advance. So I have like probably at least five different copies, both digitally and physically, of that game. Now I'm no lawyer, but my understanding of the law yeah. is that if you have purchased a copy of it, you can have the ROM um, as sort of a backup copy of it and use that. Within that context, yeah, that, and that's the assumption. That's the assumption. It's that apparently that actually came from from nowhere. People just kind of made that up, mm-hmm. from what I hear. 
Um, but also, it's never really been examined legally. All, the, all that we know for sure is that um, there really is there really are not any sort of uh, licensing laws being broken when you just release like a patch file mm-hmm. for something because you're basically saying, hey, here's this patch file. To, if you want to patch it of your own copy, wherever you get that copy from, right? That's not our business, right? Kind of kind of situation. I also do think that when you have something that is as old as some of these games that they're because a lot of these these hacks end up being a few of them are for Super Nintendo, but most of them are actually Nintendo. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're talking really old games that are from you know the um, early to mid '80s. I just don't think, especially since Nintendo has resold these so many so many times already, I just don't think they're thinking. Oh yeah, we're going to be losing out on a virtual console sale of Metroid because right. someone downloaded a, a, a rogue on ROM hack. A, this ROM hack, which by the way plays completely di- like differently from the original game, like you're not going to get the same experience mm-hmm. as you would if you had played Metroid. And that's, I think, another part of it that maybe that's kind of what we're missing here is that a lot of these hacks they're not giving you the same game remade. Right. They're not giving you oh here's the same experience that you would get, but we're going to put a modern coat of paint on it, whether that's both visually visually or or mechanically or both, it's giving you a different experience. That's the whole point. So if now, you want the if you want the actual experience of that game, you have to actually get the game. So are you saying that ROM hacks okay, um, unlicensed remakes or whatever, not okay as a general rule? I'm saying it seems like companies like Nintendo and Square Enix typically fall Typically, f- agree to that. I mean, they basically, in terms of at least what they're what they're prosecuting, what they're having their lawyers go out and send, you know, cease and desist orders mm-hmm. to, and uh, DMCA notices to, seem to all be using that kind of logic. And again, this is not a, a hard and fast rule. There actually was a ROM hack, a uh, Chrono Trigger ROM hack specifically hmm. called Echoes of Time, um, that I actually did find and download. By the way, I haven't played it yet, but um, it is it was a ROM hack that was a sequel to Chrono Trigger. And Square Enix actually did shut that one down. Interesting. It's one of the very few ROM hacks that I've ever heard that was shut down. And there was another one that I heard that was apparently a Pokemon ROM hack that also got shut down. So it happens every once in a blue moon. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I I assume it happened because, I don't know enough about the Pokemon one to speculate, but for the Chrono Trigger one, it was trying, it was basically a remake. Mm -hmm. It was doing this, here's the same characters, we're going to continue the story where where, it left off, Sure, we're going to be hacking the this, the SNES game, but it is a it is a sequel. We're going to continue. Oh, fan sequel, fan kind of sequel. Thing. Huh. Pick up where it left off. It's not a here's a reimagining of what this game could be, which is what, what most ROM hacks tend to be. Mm-hmm. Like Zelda Outlands, that's like a reimagining of Legend of Zelda. You know, Rogue Dawn is a, right. is a reimagining of the game world and concepts with a different story. It's not a here's a sequel to Further Adventures. I don't know. That's the only thing I could think of. But I, I don't. And some some of this, I think, is is probably arbitrary with their lawyers. To be quite frank. Well, I think that internally, each company is probably going to have their own formula. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a bit like how much money are we going to waste going after this versus how much money are we going to lose not going after this in the long run if this becomes our policy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I just think what what sticks with me and what um, I definitely. I uh, think we could return to at some point is just that concept of, you know, at what point, like, what defines that game? You know, is it is it literally every piece that goes into it, or is it the game? I mean, because it goes into official remakes too. True. Like yeah, Metroid true. Zero Mission was a remake of the original Metroid. Um, it adds different mechanics to it. It has new updated art. Is it the same game as the original? Well. And when you look at something like um, Enderall, have you heard of this one? This is the Skyrim one, speaking of Skyrim. Mm. Um, This is an entirely new game Mm -hmm. made pretty much entirely out of the assets of Skyrim. Mm. It's a mod. In other words, all the tools that they shipped. So you can download this and you can play this if you have a copy of Skyrim. Mm -hmm. And by all rights... One could argue that this is um, something that they took all those assets and they made a new game. They stole those assets. They should be prosecuted. How do you feel about that? Honestly, I mean, I don't really think, and when it comes to, I I, I think that um, copyright law is way out of control just in general. I agree with that. I honestly think that, you know, you, 
you can have rights to a property for a limited time and then just let people do with it what they will and um, let let sort of like I don't the market decide or the people decide or whatever mm-hmm. what is better and what is not I just don't I just don't agree with this we're going to retain the rights to Mickey Mouse for you know a hundred years plus just because mm-hmm. at one point we had this original idea. Well, that example is exactly the right example because yeah. the reason why copyright law is getting extended, uh, you know, originally it was 30 years, then it was 50 years, yeah. then it was 80 years, and now it's like 120 or something, mm-hmm. is literally because of Disney. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not and, because of companies like yeah. Disney. It is literally because oh, yeah. of and, Disney and, they, and because of Mickey Mouse, yeah. and they keep extending it. And are they really that afraid that someone else is going to come out and make a Mickey Mouse cartoon that will be – what, better, better than their Mickey Mouse cartoon? I mean, if that's what they're worried about, then maybe they should just have a better animation department, well, quite frankly. I'm not sure it's about a cartoon. I, I think it's about uh, just having that image on a backpack. But the thing is, you go to any country in the world that isn't like a first world nation, mm-hmm. you're going to see a knockoff Mickey Mouse. Oh, yeah. Mouse. You're oh, yeah. going to. Um, you know, I grew up with that stuff because I grew up overseas. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I saw the knockoff everythings, you know, everything from Winnie the Pooh to Mickey Mouse. Um, and, and half of them were bad. Like, they were drawn really bad. Um, and then some of them were just direct transfers that weren't licensed. Mm-hmm. And it's it just doesn't matter. You look at it and you immediately know, oh, that was printed in China. And Mickey Mouse's face is well, blue. That's funny. You look at, like, older characters and older, older situations like um, Robin Hood, for example, that mm-hmm. old story. And people have done all sorts of different reimaginings of that story. Right. That's right. You know? that's right. And the ones that are bad... Just get forgotten. Yeah. The ones that are that are good, we remember. Yeah. Um, it's another thing. Sherlock Holmes is another great example. Oh, another great example. Um, yeah. Conan is something that also um, some of those ori- a few of those original stories I think are still under copyright, mm-hmm. but al- but almost none of them are at this point. Even the original stories. That makes sense. And um, there's plenty of of Conan stories that were written. Like I know Marvel Comics wrote a ton of them. Conan mm-hmm. stories. Mm-hmm. There were also um, various writers um, like uh, L. Uh, El Sprague Camp, El the Camp. I forget his name exactly. Easy for you to say. Yes, um, but uh, there were a lot of different writers, and the ones that wrote the better stories, those get remembered, and people remember those. Yeah. Um, and the ones that don't, which is quite a few of them, admittedly, just kind of get washed yeah. away. Where would we be with King Arthur if that was under copyright? Right. right? I mean, mm-hmm. so many different King Arthur stories. <laughs> uh, one of my personal favorites is by Stephen Lawhead, and how he took that into his uh, Taliesin series, hmm. one nobody's ever heard of, but it's out there. Yeah, so, I mean, kind of to answer your question in, in admittedly a roundabout way, um, I just don't think, I, I don't really think we need such strict copyright laws. I do think that if people want to, or fans, want to create something that is um, different or new or respectful to the original, regardless of whether they're successful in that, I don't really see the harm in doing it, especially if they're not selling it. Yeah. Well, it certainly hasn't hurt LucasArts, has it? We're no. Not, now they are Disney, so that's going to be well, interesting. Yeah, and see, now that I think that was one of the fears when Disney bought them is that that, that, that policy will be eroded over time. And over I think, time, it, I think yeah. it will be because Disney is very hawkish about their copyrights. They are the most sure. hawkish of anyone. Yeah, well, the easiest way for them to kill Star Wars would be them to start going after people who do knockoffs of Star Wars. Because that, that community is... Mm-hmm is built around the idea of I go out on the weekend and I put on my stormtrooper uniform and I cosplay. Mm-hmm. This is not a personal narrative. Well, they've already they've already been ban- <laughs> they've, they've already banned the uh, Leia bikini or tried to. Yeah, it's true. It's very and that true. was a popular uh, cosplay costume. So, what's our takeaway then for this uh, idea of the modded ROMs versus the remakes versus with these? I mean, because here's the thing: mm. right now. Yeah, sure. I'm playing um, Assassin's Creed and enjoying it, but that franchise is going to fade. In 10, 20 years, nobody's going to remember Syndicate. And then there's going to be some who do, and they're going to want to go back, and they're going to bring in all these different assets from all these different Assassin's Creed games, and they're going to recreate the Master Assassin's Creed uh, omnibus where you can play all the games together as anything, and all the the assets are going to be conflated. And that's kind of a cool idea. Mm. Twenty years from now, does Ubi? I mean, I don't want to do they have the right, but should they go after them for that, or is this like some kind of a a renaissance, literally, mm. uh, <laughs> since it's set in the Renaissance? Uh, but you know, a, a, a gaming renaissance where they could bring back the property. You know, is that is that what the real fear is here? Remaking Metroid is that helping 
to bring back Metroid? Is Metroid something that needs to be brought back, or is uh, is Metroid dead? Um, I think I think the fan base. I think Metroid still has a very loyal fan base. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the, one of the things that annoys people just in general about Metroid is that Nintendo seems a little too focused on the fact that it's not as big in Japan. Metroid is much bigger in um, the U.S. and Europe than mm-hmm. it is in Japan. That makes sense. And many have speculated that's one of the reasons why Met, uh, Nintendo doesn't push Metroid as much as, say, Legend of Zelda mm-hmm. or Mario. Because those those do well all over the world. Metroid doesn't seem to... I mean, it's not like it has no fans in Japan, but it hasn't caught on as much. Who doesn't like an Italian plumber? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on. So I, those... I, 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 maybe they're just more universal, Mario. But um, so yeah, I do Could think be. I do think that Nintendo, when they release a game like um, Federation Force, mm-hmm. which Metroid fans t- took as an insult after waiting so long for another Metroid game after Other M, which was a direct, it basically was uh, spitting in the face of fans. Other M was garbage. It was bad design in a it number of ways. It was really badly designed. It also just completely ruined. The character of Samus. I mean, it was just That's true. she was a completely different character. Nobody liked it. Everyone from all sides attacked that character. The way the character was portrayed, but the, mechanically the game sucked too. It was it evil just Samus from the alternate universe. There we go. Yeah. That's what was. Um, and and then this this new one, Federation Force, is not even attempting to be a Metroid game. It's yeah. just a completely different game that has Metroid slapped the Metroid name slapped onto it. So it 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 feels almost like an insult uh, to fans. Mm-hmm. And then you sort of compound that by when some fan who, you know, has been working for years loves the game Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, puts a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into a new project, and Nintendo comes along and says, no, uh, you have to take this down. So, I don't know. I just, I don't really see, I honestly don't see the reasoning behind it, aside from Mm -hmm. them thinking that in some way it harms them, and I don't see how. Yeah. I don't know. Whenever you've got an old character who is a... To use the technical term, a mute, um, which is an empty avatar that you pour yourself into. There's really no backstory. It's basically you see the ship, and then you're running around on the planet, and that's kind of it. And and you don't really know what kind of a federation exists out there. You don't really know the personality of this person other than what you're injecting yourself into. You, and, and all of you that, say all that end, but that changed another M. Well, that's my point. <laughs> that's my point. Is maybe the real problem with other M wasn't what was said, but that the meta didn't match the meta that was in our head. Our head canon. It was both. Was different. It was both. I'm not saying it was good. What was said was pretty terrible. Uh, yes. But, <laughs> but I'm not saying it was good. But what I'm saying is maybe even something better wouldn't have been accepted either because it still wouldn't have match what was in our head and i wonder if if that plays into this is that what we're really craving the reason why we want to go back to these old games is what we're really craving is the empty experience that we poured ourselves into as kids rather than the spoon-fed robust experience that we're getting today Mm -hmm. and that is fodder for a whole nother show i agree yeah so uh, well, um, I guess this kind of closes our discussion on um, ROM hacks, fan remakes, and the legality thereof. So, um, I'm Jim. And I'm Doc. Thanks for joining us for this episode number 92 of the BackwardDashCompatible.com podcast. We'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.